My name is Dr. Rashmi Halker Singh, and I'm the deputy editor of the Headache Journal. I'm joined today by two of the authors of the Wolf Award winning paper entitled Chronic versus Episodic Migraine. The 15 day threshold does not adequately reflect substantial differences in disability across the full spectrum of headache frequency. Dr. Ishii and Dr. Dodik. Before we begin, Congratulations from the entire editorial board at the Headache Journal on this award. This is a very thoughtful paper that's brought additional conversations about how we consider migraine, both episodic and chronic from the patient perspective, both in terms of headache frequency and attack related disability. We're honored that you chose to publish this piece with us and we were able to share your research and be part of this important conversation. Um, let's go ahead and get started on this conversation today. So this study comes from the Armour database. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the Armour, uh, American Registry for Migraine Research Armour was established by the American Migraine Foundation and its multi-center longitudinal patient registry that collects the patient clinical data imaging and biospecimen huge number of patients are enrolled and its data is well organized. Great, so it's, a, it's really a patient database where we were able to collect lots of information. And I think this is really important that this is one of the pieces that we're able to collect from that. Yeah, what you. were the objectives of this specific uh, study and um, you know, how did you set out to accomplish your study? Okay. Um, by using the AMA database, uh, we divide the 836 patients with migraine into four groups based on migraine uh, headache frequency. And the 0 to 7, 8 to 14, and 15 to 23, and 24 or more headache days per month. And analyze is demonstrated that the patient with 8 to 14 headache days per month were comparable to the patient with 15 to 23 headache days per month for many scores of disease burden, including the headache intensity, work productivity, pain interference, anxiety, and depression. However, the patient in the 0 to 7 headache days per month group had significantly lower scores compared to all other groups, and the patient with 24 or more headache days per month have significantly higher scores compared to all other groups in many indicators. So the results suggest that the patient with 8 to 14 headache days per month and 15 to 23 have very similar disease burden. So differences between chronic migraine and episodic migraine, which is previously reported many uh, may have been influenced by the group of zero to seven headache days per month and the group of 24 or more headache days per month. So essentially the people who have at least eight days of headache per month were more similar to the chronic migraine population than people who have episodic migraine. And it's interesting that people who have essentially continuous, um, continuous pain, it seems like they had a, a more substantial disease burden than, um, than, uh, than other people in the study. Is that, is that correct as well? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and this is a question for both of you, were any of these findings unexpected? Uh, I, mean, I skipped the discussion, so <laughs> if, you know, if we go back and back in 2000, I believe in 2020, Jess Olison and a number of us looked at a data set from the Danish Headache Re Registry, um, from the Danish Prescription Database, um, from Danish Statistics, which, is, which monitors the population there in Denmark and compared that to a, a large Russian student cohort, actually, of medical students. And basically what they found was that patients with what has previously been informally termed high frequency episodic migraine, eight to 14 days per month, looked very similar with regard to disability, sociodemographics, utilization of healthcare resources to the group with chronic migraine. So the question was, are we leaving behind a substantial subgroup of patients 
with high frequency episodic migraine who in every way, shape and form look to be as disabled as the chronic migraine population because we know that in countries all over the world, patients with chronic migraine get access to certain benefits, whether it's pension benefits, retirement benefits, access to medicine, access to care, um, than patients with episodic migraine. So we may not be capturing the entire patient population who, have a, who has a high burden of disease. Um, and so that's really what prompted actually us to look at the CAMEO study, which as you know, is a population-based survey. So we cut that population up with similar frequency ranges as Dr. Ishii did in this study, eight to 14, 15 to 23, 24 plus, and one to seven, and found essentially the same thing, that with regard to comorbidities, disability, healthcare resource utilization, the patients with high frequency episodic migraine, eight to 14 days per month, looked very similar to the group with chronic migraine, but especially to the group with who had between 15 to 23 headache days per month. So that reinforced what, you know, what we found in the, uh, in the Copenhagen Danish Russian uh, cohort study. And so Dr. Ishii exploited this very valuable and rich data set through the American Registry for Migraine Research and looked at similar segments of the patient population with episodic and chronic migraine. And he just um, told you what the results were. So, now we have three different sources of data. What's different, of course, with the um, Armour Registry data is that it's longitudinal prospective where patients were followed over time. But nevertheless, we have three sources of data now that all coalesce, converge on the same, with the same conclusion. And that is that this group with eight to 14 days per month look very similar to the group with chronic migraine. And so, Back in 2004, when we developed, when the ICHD developed for the first time diagnostic criteria for chronic migraine, two years later, in an unprecedented move, we had to revise the criteria. So we never believed from the beginning that we got the criteria right. And two years later, as you may recall, we had to come up with ICHD2R for the revised, reclassifying essentially chronic migraine because we were leaving a whole swath of the population behind who didn't meet the criteria. And recall that the chronic migraine threshold of 15 days really harkens back to the old Silberstein Lipton criteria of transformed migraine, where essentially we want, they wanted to define a patient population who had headache on more days than not, i.e. 15 or more out of the 30. And so it was an arbitrary threshold that was carried forward into ICHD. And now with the luxury of time over the last 17 years and with Dr. Ishii's new paper, we see that indeed we may be leaving, we may be leaving behind a significant proportion of the population who should have access to the same level of care uh, and should be approached with the same level of rigor um, by clinicians as the patients with chronic migraine. Yeah, I think this work is so important as we, you know, take a more patient-centric ap approach to clinical practice. When we see patients in clinic, we really think about the disability associated with their attacks, not only with their attack frequency, but also how much disability they have with their attacks. And I think, um, you know, taking that into consideration and also really focusing on this high frequency episodic migraine population demonstrating that they have significant dis disability with their attacks is really, really important. So I, I think this is really fascinating work and will, will really add a lot to the way we consider the disease and also um, you know, a lot to when we think about instituting prevention. As we know, we want to start preventive treatment not only when people have attacks, you know, occurring on a regular basis, even a couple of times per week, but even less often and have significant disability with their attacks. But I think that's not always widely understood. But um, adding more attention to this high frequency episodic migraine population will probably help with that as well. So I, I think this is really, really important and fascinating from that standpoint, um, as we think about this from a patient perspective. 
and um, and really interesting from that standpoint. What do you think about this continuous headache population? Because they also seem to be excluded from many clinical trials, and your study demonstrated that they also have significant disability. You know, how do we tend to, you know, how do we uh, capture that you know, going forward as well? Well, you know, I, as you know, Dr. Halker, you manage patients every day with chronic migraine. And you know that this group with continuous headache, who, who basically have a headache every waking moment of every single day, they're a different patient population. And you're right. In the old days, not so old, <laughs> but, you know, I guess in the recent past, we used to exclude patients with chronic migraine or chronic daily headache from clinical trials because they're too difficult, it's too complex, they're too treatment resistant, so we just exclude them. We did that with medication overuse headache, we've done it with post-traumatic headache, and, and even in contemporary clinical trials, we require some degree of headache freedom because we think that this group with continuous headache are far too treatment resistant and intractable to put into clinical trials. And so I think Dr. Ishii's work has shown that this group is sets itself apart, even from the group between eight and 23 days, because they significantly separate on all outcome parameters from all of the subgroups with lower levels of frequency. So we really need to focus in on that group of patients in a way that we've never done before and really begin to try to understand from a genetic standpoint, from a biomarker standpoint, from an imaging standpoint, and from a treatment response standpoint, how different are they from other frequency subgroups? So I think this really sort of tees up uh, an opportunity for future research and one that has really not been done, uh, the kind of research that's really not been done before because this group with 30 days per month has been lumped together with the group that has 15 days per month. And I think you would all agree that they're quite different. So are we thinking that maybe um, there should be new classification for migraine, something about, you know, the less than eight days per month category, you know, the eight to 23 day category, and then, you know, 24 to continuous headaches. Should we be looking at this from that sort of, you know, perspective? Oh, well, you know, I don't think, you know, just as I said, we kept revising the criteria for chronic migraine. I think it's time to revise it again but in no way do I think this is the end of the story, right? So, but it's the next most reasonable step to capture a very large segment of the migraine population who I think in many ways are being left behind. But, you know, treating headache days as a continuous variable and using certain methods like latent class analysis or unsupervised machine learning to determine whether there's a cut point, whether there truly are thresholds, um, or whether this is a spectrum, which I think many of us believe this is a spectrum disorder, um, that's for future research to, to decide. The other thing is, you know, in my debate with Dr. Hershey, he felt like we should just have, we should just classify all these patients with migraine. I disagree with that. If a patient has five attacks a year or has had five attacks in their lifetime, is, is that patient with migraine the same as the patient who has headache every waking moment of every single day? No. And, and whether you study them from an imaging standpoint, from a blood biomarker standpoint, from a CSF biomarker standpoint, from an imaging standpoint, structurally and functionally, their brains are different. And when you look at other chronic diseases, whether it's congestive heart failure, um, whether it's chronic kidney disease, whether it's asthma, they all have stages, right? so that clinicians know what stage of the disease they're dealing with. These are all chronic diseases that are on a spectrum, no question, but there are, there's a classification so that we know that a patient with class four congestive heart failure is very different from the patient with class one congestive heart failure. And so maybe that's the answer. Maybe you know thresholds of eight and 15 and 23 are, are are, are, are not the final solution, and I don't think they are, but I think it's where we have a lot of data now, as I mentioned, you know, uh, we have three big studies coalescing and converging on that, that cut point of eight. So I think it's time to revise the criteria for the benefit of patients, um, but continue our research 
to come up with a better classification in the future. This is a this is an iterative process, right? And we're not going to have the final answer today, but I think Dr. Ishii's work and the work of this entire uh, group of authors who, who uh, participated in this study, which is an extremely important study, has moved the needle, I think has moved us forward. Uh, and it's now time, I think, for the classification committee to take a real hard look at this and decide whether or not we need to come up with an ICHD3R, right? Just like we did 2006 with an ICHD2R. I'll let Dr. Ishii, I've been talking too much. Now I'm gonna let Dr. Ishii talk again. <laughs> Dr. Ishii, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I agree with the Dr. Dolik. And uh, 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 I think the patient with uh, H214 headache this per month should be treated as having a chronic migraine and this should be and they should be treated many options. So uh, I agree with Dr. Dodik. You know, Dr. Halker, in a number of countries around the globe right now, to get access to some of these newer therapies like the CGRP monoclonal antibodies, you absolutely have to have chronic migraine. And in some countries it has, it has to be diary proven, right? And so, there, there's an example of where, and I'm not just singling out the monoclonal antibodies, it's true for botulinum toxin because that's only approved for chronic migraine. Um, but as newer therapies become available in the future, we can't leave behind millions of patients just because they don't fit in a 15 day threshold when we know that they're equally as disabled, impacted and burdened by their disease. So that is the clinical implication here. And that's why I believe it's in the best interest of patients to revise this classification now. Well, as we all look to become a more patient-centric you know, community and we to think to practice medicine from a more patient-centric standpoint, I think this is really, really important work and sets us up for the future in a really well, um, nice way. Do you, um, do either of you have any other final comments to add? Because I feel like we could can probably continue this conversation for a really long time. I would just like to applaud Dr. Ishii on his um, his work. You know, he spent two years with us at the Mayo Clinic, and he he worked very hard on this, like very hard. Um, spent, I would say, the better part of a year on this, and maybe longer. Dr. Ishii, you can correct me, uh, but I just want to applaud him and congratulate him on. Um, you know, work that will leave a mark. This will make an impact. And this will make an impact in the field. So from a scientific and an academic standpoint, it's, it's interesting. It's going to move, it's going to inform future research. But more importantly than that, from a clinical standpoint and from a patient standpoint, I think it's gonna actually impact patient care. So if we can improve the lives of millions of people who otherwise wouldn't get access to treatment, um, or certain treatments or certain uh, benefits that only patients with chronic migraine get access to. I think the implications of this clinically for patient care are profound. So I wanna congratulate and applaud Dr. Ishii for a job well done. Thank you. <laughs> congratulations, Dr. Ishii. Congratulations, Dr. Dodik. And congratulations to all of your co-authors because this is really, really important work. Um, it's, it's very thoughtful and it's something that I will definitely be sharing with our trainees as they come through our headache clinic because I think it's, um, it's really important and will impact the way we think about patient care as well. So thank you for this paper and thank you for sharing your evening with me this today. Thanks, Dr. Halker.